everybody, and welcome to episode 47 of All About African Violets. All About African Violets is musically sponsored by Ted Yoder. You can hear his awesome music on his website at tedyoder.com. It is also available for my tunes. Hi everybody, come on into my sunroom. Sit down, relax. I'm happy to see you. Welcome. You can see it's a it's I'm recording on a Saturday in the after, late afternoon. It has been a beautiful day in Chicagoland. Spring has finally arrived, at least I'm hoping it has because I did have to crack my winter coat out one last time early in the week, but everything seems to be blooming. The trees finally leafed out this week. That's how late spring is. The trees just finally, everything seems to be leafed out now. It was just crazy. We had, it was wild. Anyway, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I've got lots to share with you this week. So let's move right into tips and treasures because as I mentioned last week briefly, um, I got my new African Violet magazine last week and I also I don't think I showed this to you yet. You'll remember that I mentioned that I ordered another African Violet book from the UK. I found this on, um, it was either, I think I found it on Amazon and it just, I, I thought I had heard about it. It's got a, a, a shiny cover on it, which is keeping it together. There was a, a rip in the actual dust jacket, but this is an amazing book. This is called African Violets and it's by Reinhild Reistrick. And if you have any interest in the species plants, just the phenomenal drawings. I'm trying to get that where you can see it. Oh, there I am. Um, these drawings are just stunning. And they're all drawings. There are paintings of the different species. This one is another gorgeous one. And in addition to the African violet species, it also has things like here's Gladiolus rupicolis. I mean, this is just a gorgeous botanical book. So if, if you have an interest in, in stuff like this, this was a spendy one again, but this is gorgeous. And on the, I'll read you the back. It says, um, it's called a monograph. This monograph on the genus St. Polia contains a unique record of paintings of all known African violet species. And then there's a note here from Philip Cribb from the Royal Botanic Gardens uh, in Kew in, in London. And, or Kew, I guess, not actually London. Um, African violets are iconic, one of the most important of all plants in the nursery trade for pot plants. Every year, millions are sold in nurseries, supermarkets, and flower shops all around the world. However, little if any thought is ever given to their exotic origin or to the current perilous state of the species and their shrinking habitats in East Africa. This fine memoir will surely raise awareness and concern both here and in East Africa. So I just wanted to share that with you. And look at all these yellow things I've got for things to share with you. The May-June issue of African Violet Magazine. And it did come for me last week, it was here, but I, I wanted to finish up question day that stretched for like three weeks. So I didn't um, share it with you, but there's all kinds of stuff in it. And I always love when I see something from someone who views the podcast, that I happen to know views the podcast. Here's a photo, a beautiful photo, and a beautiful plant, and it is a species plant. And this is St. Paulia Confusa Mather E, and it's exhibited and photographed by Elsie Maxwell. So, hi Elsie, gorgeous plant, <laughs> I love it. And here's something, this is, a very short article and in fact it's just a couple of paragraphs so I'm going to read them to you because it is really really important stuff it's from Joe Bruns and it's called what's in a name and Joe Bruns is the ABSA registration chairman and we've talked about this before about um, first class two and I just um, this is just so important that I really want to share it with you 
Joe says it is almost impossible to accurately identify an African violent violet that oops I said violent African violet that doesn't have a name tag or other type of identification an annoyed or no ID or you know a plant with no identification we call them noids no IDs the kind you get in a big box store look kind of like my big box violet Joe goes on to say the African violet master list of species and cultivars the AVML and the first class computer program list more than 16,000 different named African violets and their descriptions depending on your no ID you could find a few dozen that match the characteristics. You might even be able to narrow it down to four or five. But then you would need to choose one of them, and it would be highly unlikely that you would choose the correct name. Besides that, the AVML has less than half of the named African violets. I didn't know that, you guys. There's 16,000 in there. That is less than half of named African violets. Even if you found a photo that matched your plant exactly, the odds are great that it is not your plant. So many African violets look the same and they all grow differently under different growing conditions. It is definitely a mistake to try to identify a no ID in this manner. There are already far too many misidentified African violets out there now. Just ask anyone who has done classification and entries at any African violet show. Please don't add to the problem. So I just think that's so critical, which is why I really wanted to share it with you. And there are some great articles. As always, this month we talked recently about pH and water, and there's a great article by Neil Lipson. Hi, Neil. Water quality, pH, and water treatment. Might want to read that one. And um, hold off. I've got, I got all my little stickers here. Um, ten, the beginner's column this month is written by Mary Schaefer. And her, the her title of her article is 10 Common Mistakes New and More Than a Few Experienced African Violet Growers Make. So this is a great one. And I'll just go through some of these real quickly for you. She says, number one, not, not labeling a plant because I'll remember what it is and label it tomorrow. Well, uh, you guys have seen me make that mistake and thankfully I knew based on because it was in a little teeny weeny pot I knew that it was the leaves of champagne pink that I had put down because I didn't write it down and thought oh yeah I'll remember that one always write it down or making a label with a piece of white paper and writing on it with ink she says the face of on the face of this it seems like a logical step but won't ink last longer than pencil well it won't and if you in the light it will fade I don't use ink or pencil. I use a brother label maker. You guys, I think you've seen it. I, I pay the money to have the tape and punch in the, type in the name of the plant and the date I potted it. It spits out a label and I, it's great because you can pull them off. You can reuse them and just cross out the date. They're, they're great. Three, she says, putting a leaf or cutting in a glass of water, confident that you will pot it up tomorrow. Okay, do that. Don't do that, I mean pot them, put them down in your potting mix. Don't leave them in the water. Skipping a potting size, rationalizing that the plant will end up in a four or five inch pond, so why not put it there to begin with? That's a problem. Not purchasing a plant at a chapter show or affiliate show, only to regret passing it up later. Now, we always talk about limiting our collection, but sometimes you see one and you think, oh, I really wanna to try to grow that. And if you have, you know, maybe you don't have a lot of access, then yeah, you're going to want to pick it up or try to get a leaf. Okay. Uh, six, purchasing too many plants at an event and then squashing them in among your other violets, giving none of them the space to grow properly. This is limit your collection in other words. Seven, not segregating a plant when it was first purchased, figuring you knew the seller or it's only one plant, how much damage could it do? 
being too critical of your own plants and when selecting entries for a show, only to have a plant that is not nearly as well grown as yours go off with a best in class award. Failing to clean a pot before entering a violet in a show. That came up at the Illinois show this, this year. Hovering over your plants, giving them too much water and repotting too often. To be fair to the experienced growers reading this, this mistake is rarely made by seasoned growers. The problem is usually just the opposite, finding the time to water and repot in a timely manner. But you guys, this is a great article. I highly recommend it. It's not just for beginners. So check that one out. Um, also, there's a good article and great photos in here, an article on leaf propagation by Jim Toms. And you know, it's always good to see what other people are doing. You know, I know how I put leaves down. This is how he puts leaves down. He uses a Ziploc bag, you know, kind of does the little greenhouse thing. If he only has one leaf, makes perfect sense to me. And so that's a good one to take a look at. Oh, if you happen to be an ABSA senior judge and it's time for you to take your next senior exam, the notice is in this edition of the magazine. You need to contact Meredith Hall and get your stuff together. I don't think I have to take one this year. I took my third. I think I'm good for three years now before I have to take another one. Here are some beautiful plants, and these plants belong to Leonard Ray. And there's Thunder Surprise and Rob's Bow Peep. Both photos taken by Jackie Eisenhut. I, I am acquainted with both Jackie and Leonard, although it's been a long time since I've seen either of them. But I, I wanted to particularly share this with you because it kind of leads into the, the one little sticky here that I, that I skipped over. My very first show that I judged as, as a student judge was for Pomona Valley African Violet Society in Southern California. Pomona Valley doesn't exist anymore, but Leonard was one of the judges on the panel on my very first time that I judged um, as a student judge. And I will never forget it or him because I was doing my best, you know, to pay attention and listen to what everyone was saying on the pan, you know, the other, uh, other judge and Leonard and listening to them. And we got about, I would say, two thirds of the way through the show. And, and they were talking and I was nodding, you know, like deer in the headlights, nodding. And uh, all of a sudden, we got to a class and Leonard turned to me and said, let's hear what our student judge has to say about this plant. And I never forgot it. I never forgot it because all of a sudden, someone was listening to me, even as a, as a rank beginner at the bottom of the totem pole. And he and the other judge both agreed with what I had to say. I was like, oh, yay, yippee. But he was a great teacher and a great person to judge with. And so I, I always remember that because that's what I try to do now when I have a student judge on a panel that I'm a, a member of. I really always try to, and I I'm kind of have a reputation as being a slow judge. And I think that's why because I, I really try to make sure that the student on the panel gets to learn and because that's what Leonard Ray did for me. So thanks, Leonard. And gosh, gorgeous plants. They're beautiful. But Pomona Valley also ties in with um, the In Memory column this, in this edition of the magazine. Um, Iris Keating has passed away and for those of you who have not been around the AVSA for many, many years, um, you might not recognize her name. Um, but if you lived in Southern California and you've been a longtime member of the AVSA, you will recognize her name because I'm just going to read you this short obituary. She was very kind to me. I only met her once or twice. But again, I was a very young student judge and she was very, very kind. And it says here, the African violet world lost one of its most dedicated enthusiasts when Iris Keating passed away in March. An AVSA Life member, Iris was a grower, exhibitor, designer, 
artist and photographer, sharing her expertise graciously and with seemingly endless energy and humor. Whatever project she took on got her complete focus and meticulous attention to detail. Her artwork provided show staging and graced the covers of club yearbooks and show schedules, as well as the printed version of the, Af of the AVML. She wrote creative schedules, a syllabus for new clubs eager to put on a show, how-to articles on a wide range of Gisneriad related topics. Iris was a regular convention attendee. She was an AVSA plant registration chairman before Joe Bruns and uh, helped computerize the what used to be called the MVL. So she was very instrumental in that. Besides being a master judge, she also held nearly every office in the Pomona Valley African Violet Society, the African Violet Council of Southern California, and the Judges Council of Southern California. Iris Keating was always a class act, and her sharing spirit is her lasting legacy. I really wanted to share that with you because she touched my life as an African Violet grower, and um, we're so lucky in, in the AVSA, um, the African Violet Society of America. There are so many people like Iris who had, she had such great knowledge and such a wealth of knowledge and always willing to share. So I really hope that you guys um, have people like that in your area, people that you can talk to and learn from. And the last article I wanted to share with you in the magazine is, is by Dale Martins. You know, you've You've met Dale already on the podcast. She, this article today um, was actually published originally in the Empire Violet Magazine, which is the publication of the New York State African Violet Society. And it's called Gisneriads, What is Ornamental? And there's a great picture here of one of her straps, Heartland's Midnight Sun. Neil Lipson took that photo, it's beautiful. But here's the article. And I really encourage you to read this article. This is something that comes up time and again in every show, almost every show, about Gisneriads uh, entered in the non-blooming category, entered for foliage. And Dale, who is a Gisneriad judge teacher, has such great knowledge in this area. Um, and she, she says that, you know, often have seen petri petrocosmias, not, not like carii, but the little teeny roundy ones that pretty much grow themselves, you know, uh, seen them getting a best in class when, when really they should be in a, they're really not an ornamental foliage type of plant. She lists um, some other uh, Gisneriads here. I really recommend that you read this article. This is a great one, a really great one. Again, the magazine, African Violet Magazine, is one of the most tangible benefits of membership in the AVSA. And so if you're not a member yet of the AVSA and not getting this great magazine, on the website, on the All About African Violets website, when you're looking at it, on the right side, on the sidebar, up near the top, there is a link that says, join the AVSA. And if you click on that, it will open a PDF file that you can then print and fill out and send in with your check in the USA. It is $30 to be an annual member. And let me just look real quick here. To be an international member in Canada, it is $35. To be an international member other than Canada, it's $40. And that's all US dollars. So I, I really, I encourage you to join the AVSA. It's a great, it's so great. And convention's coming, it's so much fun. Well, you know, I, I have another treasure for you and um, I think you'll be able to see it. The first time I tried to do this with a couple of my show plants, um, I wasn't close enough, it was too dark, you couldn't see what was going on. I tried again today, so I'm hopeful that you'll be able to see it. Um, I mentioned this last week as we were looking at Rob's Antique Rose and Rob's Sarsaparilla. I said, gosh, it looks like this crown has split. And I looked at them very closely and indeed um, all of almost all the semis, three of out of the four semis um, did the same thing. 
And the only thing that is in common with them, I've never seen this before. I've never had it happen to me before. I used a different Bloom Booster fertilizer, and I think I mentioned this last week. I used something called Open Sesame. And apparently, it doesn't like my conditions and my water. Now, this is not to say that this is a poor fertilizer because I think a lot of people use it and love it. This is the same with, um, I had a problem in Southern California. I tried using Dynagro fertilizer. I know there are thousands of people who use Dynagro and love it, but it never worked well for me. And Open Sesame seems to be in that category for me as well. So what I did was look at those wonky centers and I tried to remove the extraneous leaves leaving the crown where it should be and we'll cross our fingers. So take a look at the footage and I'll see you on the other side. Hi everybody, I'm down here in the basement. This is Rob Sasparilla. I'm trying to get a good trying to make it the first time I tried this it didn't work so I, I couldn't get a, a good I couldn't get it where you could see it I hope you can see this now can you see that here we are in the crown of this plant and there are little this is what looks to be the actual crown and over here there are additional little leaves that I'm just going to take off. Now, I do not really know. I've never had this happen to me before. So I removed this, so now we're just back down to a regular crown. The plant does look like it might bloom in time for national. We'll see. The symmetry is not bad. Um, I need to give it a bath. It's a little bit dirty, um, but it's looking pretty good. So I have another one here that I'll show you. This is Geisha Girl. Let me get where you can see it. I think you can see it there. Now, the same thing is happening here. And the symmetry on this plant is not ideal. It, it's really not. And I'm trying to decide if I'm going to take an entire row of leaves off it or not. Um, but the same thing is happening with this one. This also happened with Rob's antique rose. And like I, like I think I've already said, the only thing that I did differently this time was I used a different bloom boosting fertilizer. And that is not to say that it's not a good fertilizer, but it doesn't seem to be good for me in my conditions. So what I'm going to do here is something similar to what I've done on sarsaparilla. And I hope you can see what I'm doing. There is an extra leaf here that should not be here. It's like it's trying to start a new crown over here and I that's just not what we want. Okay, I think we're all right. So we've got this one here, I think this has got to go too. Not sure. I guess that needs to go there. Um, I guess we'll wait and see how it does. I, I know this is a little odd to be looking at. I hope that you could see what I was doing just trying to assist this plant in in uh, getting rid of those extra leaves that sprouted in that way. I'm looking to see if I had my 
my note cards down here. I'm down in the basement. I don't have them. So anyway, I just wanted to show you that. Um, kind of a pre-show. We've still got a little ways to go. Um, and uh, cross our cross my fingers. All right, I'll be right back. I hope you could see that pretty well. I think you could. <laughs> I looked at it, but I didn't actually look at the footage before I sat down to record now. But I checked it on the camera, and I, I think it was clear enough and light enough and close enough for you to see what I was doing. Of course, you got like a real close up of my hands in there, you know, and the tweezers trying to do that. So, but we cross our fingers. Well, National is coming, and I'm so excited, and I hope you're excited too. But before National gets here, Let's take a look at what's on the stands. Hi everybody, it's time for a look at what's on the stands. You'll notice things do look a little different on the top shelf this week. These are the show hopefuls, but things are not looking too hopeful. I'm a little, a little worried actually. Um, as I've already mentioned to you, the footage that I tried to shoot um, on the work that I did on this plant, Rob Sarsaparilla, and also on Rob's Antique Rose. It was so dark that you couldn't see anything. And I'm, I'm very disappointed about that because I wanted to show you really what was happening with those crowns. Um, this is Geisha Girl. This is Optimar Little Azurite. It doesn't even have any blossoms set at all, so obviously it's not going to show. This is Pixie Blue, looking good, and I, again, you missed seeing the grooming that I did on it last week, um, or, you know, when I was filming, because it was so dark you couldn't see it. But here it is, and uh, it's definitely looking a little better. It's looking cleaned up, and I did have to remove some spent blossoms from this one, so it did bloom a little early, so I guess we're just going to have to wait and see how it does in the next week and a half. And I'm hoping these blossoms will open on Rob Sarsaparilla. Geisha Girl is looking good. I'm crossing my fingers for Geisha Girl. Let's walk around here. I've, I've just got blossoms setting now on Max Glacial Grape. They're just, they're just here now. I don't know if they will get cracking quickly enough to open. This is Blueberry Sprite, and you guys, it has bloomed very, very differently this time than it did the last time. And once again, I can only attribute this to the open sesame fertilizer that I used. I used a different type. I had this hap happen to me once before with a plant, with a fertilizer that didn't do well for me. I never had good luck with Dynagro. But I'm. this plant is now... a. Uh, the blossoms are two-tone with pink tips and, and the white edge. Um, it's very, very different. I'm not sure how this is going to how this is going to go. I mean, I guess we're just going to wait and see. I, I will make a decision on it before I take it. Um, the blossom stalks, you know, they do grow. They're long. They grow well. They want to stand up, but it's it's looking very, very different. Anyway. Well, you know, this is it. You you pay your money and you take your chances, right? <laughs> and as always, that's what the podcast has been about from the very beginning, about the things that happen as we are growing our plants. Well, let's take a look at the second shelf. Here's Fisherman's Paradise. Here is Reflections of Spring. I think that's fresh air. Pow wow. Some mooch me. And uh, let's take a look down here. Did a little grooming. This is that Jersey Girl Trail. I'm not sure that I'm going to keep this one, guys. Again, I'm waiting to see how the new growth really grows here. It's looking kind of small initially, but, you know, it can come back. We'll see. And, you know, this is part of the reason that you grow a number of different plants. Let's step over here I wanted to show we're not going to get a blossom on Jean-Pierre Croteau so I'm going to have to just pot it on 
I must have knocked it over because both the blossom stalks broke. Either that or maybe my cleaning ladies did. God love them. They're so wonderful. But occasionally they've knocked, you know, they've bumped a plant. It's not their fault. But uh, there's everybody else down here looking pretty good. But what I was going to say is we grow a number of varieties to see what grows well for us in our conditions. So let's go take a look in the basement. This is Buckeye Lost Love and it definitely has a green edge and that's bizarre because it's not supposed to, I don't think. So I'm going to look into that a little further. Here is the sport of um, A. John's Winter Sun. You need a blossom come off there. Really interesting. Loving that. Everybody else here just hanging out. This is um, EK Sky Azure. It's getting ready to bloom. I want to see it. See the blossom on it? Schumann's Paradise. I like being able to at least show, a, show you a few things that are blooming. That always makes me happy. Quick look under the dome. Things looking good. Nothing exciting in there yet. And here were the show plants from Illinois. Still hanging out. I'm about ready to move these guys back upstairs. And uh, they've been down here long enough, I think. Got some condensation on them. And uh, they're ready to go back upstairs. Let's go take a look at the Streptocarpus. Here's Blue Mars. Mildew gone. Dale's Polar Berry. Heartland's White Gold. Salmon Sunset. I had to take the leaf blossoms off of um, Midnight Flame. Here's Chiffon Masquerade looking good. And I did some major cleanup here on Dancing Trail. And I think you can see that it looks, there's still a few leaves that could probably go like this one. There we go. But that it really is, for all intents and purposes, looking a whole lot better than it did last time you saw it last week. So, uh, we'll see how it does. These guys have a little while longer to stay down here and uh, before we shift things around. Because as I've mentioned before, there's just not that great air circulation down here. So I, I definitely still have some work to do and some shifting of things. Let's go up to the, up to the uh, sunroom. Here we are in the kitchen and uh, things are looking pretty good. Pretty good. I, this is Optimara Little Wichita Girl. You remember it had a bunch of red blossoms on it and I just took them off and uh, it grows in the wagon wheel style. Open, very open, but it's growing. Jersey Snowflakes, again, still looking beautiful. Got some blossoms. This is when a good sharp thumbnail comes in handy to take a spent blossom off. I shouldn't say sharp, but long. There's everybody here. Who's this getting ready to bloom? This Oh, this is A. John's Yellow Submarine. Well, I can see a hint of yellow in those blossoms, so we'll see how it does. Let's go over here. Oh, here's Irish Flirt. This often happens with Irish Flirt. Do you see there's like the brown right in the center of the blossom? That can be removed with your tweezers, those little brown spots there. And if you were taking a plant like this to show, if it was ready to go to show, and you saw those little brown centers, you can gently remove those little, those little blossoms, uh, petals of the blossom, and uh, take it with you. Here is Cherry Cola. I have wanted to grow this plant for a very long time. It is, if I'm not mistaken, quite vintage. And it is a deep, deep purple. Deep purple. It is beautiful. We'll see how it does. Well, here's a look down at the other Gisneriad shelf. And uh, Velvet is trying to bloom. 
more. You have multiple blossoms on a stalk now, on, on two of them, a couple of them, but still, you know, it's not, it's not winning me over. Here's the Ascananthus upconicus, showing some new growth right here. Here's my Texas hot chili. I hope that by next week it will be in bloom for you to see. Uh-oh, telephone. I'll be right back. Sorry about that. Anyway, here's the last look at the top shelf, and here we are, down on the Gisneria shelf on this side of it. Everybody's looking good here. Got some repotting to do. These are all rooted, and you can see lots of roots. Doing really well. Let's go take a look at the big box violet. Here it is, sparkling in the sun. It's beautiful. I topped off its reservoir yesterday. It loves it right where it's at, and uh, I don't even think it minds having the spider plant hanging all around it. It's really beautiful. Okay, that's the look at what's on the stands this week. I'll be right back. Okay, well, National's not right here, not right now, but it's time to get the bail money ready, and I want to talk about National <laughs> because I'm so excited. Um, you know, I've got my schedule, I've got my stuff all marked of the things I'm going to do, and, and I've shared it with you early on, but now it's so close. Um, we're about a week and a half out from show, and it's it's really, this is exciting. We can have two weeks out from show. I'll be headed um, out there, you know, on the Wednesday because I, I'm, I'm still crossing my fingers. You know, you've seen what's on the stands before we get the bail money ready. I should probably talk about that. You saw the look at what's on the stands. And I'm sure you noticed that a couple things were missing from the show plants. And, you know, as is usual, it does not break my heart to let a plant go um, because I'm always trying to limit my collection and National's coming up. I'm sure there will be things there that I will find that I will want to come home with and then I'm really going to have to limit my collection. I will be looking at things and making decisions and going, mm, this stays, this goes. And it's often not that there's anything really wrong with a plant. We've had this discussion before. It's more about, is it growing well for me? Is it growing well in my conditions? Is it happy here? Some plants don't like it here, and that's okay. They like it at somebody else's house, in someone else's conditions, someone else's water. It's totally fine. That's why we have so many, I think, of these wonderful plants, and so many, you know, more than, like, twice 16,000, what, more than 30,000 named varieties, because they're, they're so beautiful and there are, they grow so well and so differently in every area of the country and the world, really. And what about the big box violet? I mean, really? <laughs> what is the, the symmetry is not the greatest, but I mean, I'm looking at it now. It's got that beautiful like ice cream cone head of blossom that just big ball of pink blooms. It's beautiful. I love that. I am keeping it forever. I don't ever plan to get rid of it. <laughs> okay, now let's get the bail money ready, all right? So we're talking already a little bit about National. I had something kind of exciting happen to me, um, actually, on Saturday morning. I received an email from Mel Grice. He is the affiliate chair for the AVSA, and as such, he is in charge of the affiliate meeting at the National Convention, and they always have a breakfast and uh, it's on Friday mornings. And he emailed me and said that he'd seen an episode of the podcast and he was hoping that I would join a couple of other folks that he's asked to speak at the breakfast meeting. So I'll get to talk a little bit about all about African violets and uh, I'll be there. So if you're at National and you were not maybe planning on going to the affiliate breakfast, I would like to encourage you to go, not just because I'm going to be there, but because it's really important to hear what's going on and you may learn something or learn about an affiliate that might be in your area. If 
there is a listing and I will link to this on um, in the show notes for you. There's a listing on the AVSA website and it's broken down by regions and you can look and see what clubs and affiliates there are in your area and hopefully there is one that you can visit and eventually hopefully join. So and at the affiliate meeting, you can hear more about that. Um, oftentimes they talk about membership and, and getting new members and, and how, how different affiliates are doing that. It's always a good, um, a good event to attend at the convention. If you are not keen on having the breakfast, um, you can, the actual meeting begins, um, I think it's at 8.30, I'm gonna check here. The, the breakfast itself for food starts at 7.45, but the actual meeting starts at 8.30, and it is open to all convention attendees. So I do encourage you to go. And you know, there's so much else. Be sure to look at the schedule. I hope you're getting as excited as I am. It's just almost here and I'm so excited because you get to see a lot of people that you don't see. Sometimes you only see them once a year and it's at national. And I'm hoping to meet so many of you there. I'm really looking forward to it. So, well, that's it for today. I think, I think that's enough, isn't it? It's time to keep moving forward. I wanna thank you all for being with me here this week. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for coming back every week. And thank you for sharing the podcast with your friends. And it's available, as you know, on the website. It's also available on Blip TV and on iTunes. You can subscribe in both those places. And also, uh, you can subscribe. There is an RSS feed on the website as well. So I hope that your days are filled with all the things you love. Good growing. I'll see you next time.